brought to my attention that some may be confused on the no sin situation. Granted, it's a concept hard to buy because we know what sinners we are. There's a word in the text in First John. He that committed sin. like a word, he justified the ungodly, he continues to do so, justified this by the preaching of his word, and yet he says that we are already justified and glorified, sinned or committed is an act of continuing to do so. To live a life no different than the world before we got saved. Right? Including in that, including in that, and actually the benchmark for determining that, is loving your brethren. The sinner has no love for the brethren of the church at all. The sinner may like a few people, but the sinners not love everybody. The sinners discriminate in their love. The sinner says, I'll help you, but I won't help that one. The saint helps everybody in need, if it's within the capacity to do so. Sometimes it's not within the capacity of one to do so. It requires everybody to do so, such as you did a couple of weeks ago. It was a situation that required everybody. And I didn't get a complaint from anyone. I'll go beyond that. I didn't get a loan from anyone. I didn't get an advanced tithe from anyone. You're in this game because of your love. And that's the difference. Now, if you try to say that during that week or since then you haven't committed any sin, <laughs> John says you're a liar. <laughs> John also says, though, that if we confess our sin, now some churches are structured so that when you sin, you go confess to the pastor. Now Moses had 600,000 plus members. And they were in line all day long talking to Moses. And Jethro asked me, so what, what are you doing all day long, standing up these long lines to deal with? And Moses told me that he deals with different situations in the congregation and judgments and so on and so forth. And Jethro said, man, it's going to wear you out. He said, appoint some of the elders to handle those kind of things. Anything too hard for them, then let them take it to you. And that's why he appointed 70 elders. Now, if I heard every one of your sins, confessions, it'd be about, it'd be a bigger job than Moses' hand. It'd be like 600,000. <laughs> I can't do a thing. 
right? You have, as well as I have, a high priest. When it says in the Hebrews, having boldness to go into the Holy of Holies, you go to the Holy of Holies to cover your sins. When the high priest went in once a year, he went in and sprinkled the Ark of the Covenant with blood seven times and covered the sins of the entire congregation. Now it says the new administration, it's not necessary to wait for the priest to go in and cover your sins, that all of you have the same access. The curtain was rent from top to bottom, making the holy place open to whoever needed it. You can all have access when you sin to go in and confess your sin. Not to me, but to your priest. What you're going to find out, the worship God of sincerity is much harder to do than it is to talk to me about it. It's not easy telling God about your sin. You like to, the human reaction is, and we sin to try to forget about it. Right. Huh. Yeah. What's there, real quick prayer? Our oh, Lord, don't forgive me. Oh, Lord. It says confess the sin. When you ask God to forgive you, you have to tell God what you did. Point blank. Give as much detail as you can. Then ask God to forgive your sins. I couldn't take a confession. It would definitely mar my ability to preach to you. I knew everything you did. I don't want to know. And God's made it possible that I don't have to know anything. Go to your high priest, ask him to forgive you, and says, and he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And trust him, once you have that experience with God or confess your sins to him, you won't sin too quick again. Remember that experience and, you know, plus the saved person has a desire and a drive in them to do righteous. It's an honor your aim, your goal inside is I want to be righteous. I want to be whole. I want to be yours. I want to be holy. That's the desire in you, right or wrong. Right. Then sometimes this inside of us, called in Bible, flesh. When Jesus, when God determined to destroy the world, in Noah's day, he put flesh into the equation. To all destroy man, for he also is flesh. Yet his days should be 120 years. Flesh is a special situation. Sin dwells, and Paul said, dwell in, continue to do so in the flesh. That's what we read in Romans that time. Turn it here. Chapter 7. Verse 14. The Apostle Paul writes, For we know that the law is spiritual. But I, the flesh to me, am carnal, sold under sin. Whatever which I do, I allow not. I do things that I know I shouldn't do. For what I would do, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. What I would do, and reading my Bible for an hour, I do that which I would not want to do, and watch TV. There's a conflict there. If then I do that which I would not do, I have to consent to the law that it's good. Here's a solution. Now then there's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. God saved your soul. He didn't save your flesh. 
That's why when it takes to be with him, he has to give you a new body. Because this fleshy one, for those who are alive and remain, this fleshy one cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's flesh and blood. So for those who will be raptured, he has to change us from mortal to immortality, from flesh and blood to a glorified body. And that's why the change, because the flesh cannot be fixed. And the sin continues to dwell in the flesh. That's why Paul says here, for I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. At all. At all. And that shows the power of salvation is that salvation allows you to overcome this flesh most of the time. But it's a struggle. I mean, the flesh is going to at least speak up. It's not going to just let them die. Give an opportunity, the flesh is going to say, you know, I, I want to do, I, I want to. <laughs> let me. Choose me. The flesh wants to stay home every Sunday. But the inward man knows his source of life is hearing God's word, and he just overrides the flesh and says, you're going to church. Right? Yes. The flesh don't want to be here. You're, I mean, it's, it's uncanny to me. I hardly sleep an hour and a half at a time at night. But on Sunday, I got up, refreshed, sitting in that recliner chair and ate breakfast, and I went to sleep. Got up, put the dishes in the front, in the kitchen from there, and sat in that recliner chair in the back, and went back to sleep. I never do that. I'm sleepy right now. <laughs> Until the benediction said, and my flesh wakes right up. This is what it doesn't do. It doesn't want to be here. It doesn't want to preach. It just gets an override No, So you're going to be here now. You're going to preach today. The flesh, okay, now we preach once. Can we just like, not preach the second time? Says that to me. Every Sunday. So they'll understand. They heard one message. It was a good message. So just kind of like, you know, take it easy. And I got to tell my flesh when I leave the gas station every Sunday, you're going back to preach. Like it or not. And it never likes it. It wants church to be out more than you do. Can you imagine that? It says, just, just quit preaching you know, at, at 2 o'clock and that's enough. When I go past 2 o'clock, the flesh is like, when are you going to quit? Then the flesh says, you're tired. And it speaks up, speaks up, my flesh speaks up for your flesh. <laughs> my flesh says they've got enough. <laughs> Cut it short. That's how it works. And that's why I can say it like Paul, in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which I which is good, I find not. Why well, I found I found out to, but it's hard. It says on the flesh gets the advantage. When it does, you do what? Confess your sins. And as often as you go to confessing, it's like, you know, that's a good deal because if your confession is made to me, after a while, I'm going to get tired of you. I said, you confessed that last week. That was week before. This is your eighth time. I'm going to give you grief. Never mind, let me have confessed the same thing for the tenth time. It's your eighth. We're gonna get it right. So God allows me to have to hear that. So I can preach you with the clear channel that way. And let's assume the ones I'm preaching to are like me. That's fair. When I preach the hardest about something, I'm talking to me. Period. Most of the time it preaches to me. And my flesh says, you don't want to preach that because you're not doing that. Imagine that. Picture flesh telling you that. I'm like, what's that, got, that's what, what's that got to do with it? If I'm a preacher, I'll never do it. So I preach on something I'm not doing. I get the same faith from preaching God's word as you do from hearing God's word, and that faith caused me to overcome. I'm just, I'm just a preacher by job, by occupation. 
thing. I'm, I'm a participant, and I'm also a, a hearer of the word. So in the meantime, I come to church not to preach to you. I come here to be preached to. As the word of God goes forth, I leave rejoice like you do. I leave sometimes kind of down like you do. You know what the desire I got to do better from what I'm preaching. And then to make matters worse, I play the same CD on that same tape over and over and over and over again all week long until that word of God becomes faith and it takes root and takes hold and then it becomes to overcome these things. And sin should decrease. We're to, we're to reckon your members and stand. They're not dead. But he says, recognize them as dead. You don't, you don't, you don't get the to, to attention to somebody dead. The most you're going to do is view the body. And not too long. You're going to look at them. Right the then you move on. You don't hang around the funeral parlor all day. When you're going to come to view, not so much for you to see them. I don't get anything at all out of seeing dead people. You really go for the sake of the family. And those who are, you know, to sign a little book, to say you've been there, you've been there. I've been to funeral parlors and signed the book, and never saw the body. And of course, in Nigeria, someone's going to always call you a lie. And they say, didn't this look wonderful? I say, mm hmm. <laughs> and my members. <laughs> Sin just like that. You know? They're going to get some, the flesh gets a chance to lie, it's going to take it. But that's what the flesh does. The flesh is not in truth. The flesh gets a true story it doesn't like, it's going to change, it's going to embellish it. It'll make it more enjoyable to hear, to tell somebody. Right? By the time you get the word back that you put up there, it has a whole different twist to it. Because that's what the flesh does. That's a specialty to just, you know, I'm going to add a little here to it. Just a word or two, you know. Say this good sentences or paragraphs, he just does a word or two. Well, one word or two can change the whole story. But the flesh enjoys that. And as the flesh does, the flesh says, I know I should have done that. Why do I say that? Because it's flesh. It's what it does. I like the John. Verse 7. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now if you don't, and you want to, you ask God, Lord, to put that love in me for everybody in church. So when one suffers, I suffer also. We're all one body. I can't ignore this part of the body. I like it's not me. Because tomorrow it could be me. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Why? Because his own works were evil, and his brother righteous. What says in that verse? Let me try to share something. From all appearance, it seems to me that Cain killed Abel in church. They both were bringing offerings. To God. You got here a saved person, worse than God, and an unsaved person, worse than God. There are sinners who profess worshiping God that you know are sinners, right? That's why sometimes you don't ask a person, like, you know, are you saved and happy? You recognize the works of a sinner in them, you start witnessing about Jesus. Because obviously you don't know him or have a distorted view about Jesus. The saved one, Abel, brought a blood sacrifice. 
Not a single blood is lower Mr. Sims. The unsaved one, Cain, brought the fruit of his own works. What Cain brought required a lot more work than Abel's. I mean, to bring produce from the ground to God, he put a lot of time in. He had to plant it, he had to take the weeds out, take care of it, he had to water, irrigate it, hold the weeds out all the time until it came to fruit. Then he got his fruit up, cleaned it all up, washed it, and brought this nice fruit tray to God. Whereas this man just went out and got a lamb and killed it. His job took about five minutes. His took about five months. Then he brought with God, fire come from heaven, and broke this one up. He started waiting for it to happen to his, and it didn't happen. Then God asked me, so why is your countenance falling? Why are you in church talking your head down like you got an attitude? God hates attitudes in his house. Works for him. So he called him on it. He said, if you bring what's asked, won't you be doing well? And Reverend King said, yeah, you're right. And then go get a lamb. He said, kill the spinner. Now oh, he wasn't saved. That's what it says here. Let us came who was of that wicked one to his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, although he caused his works worse than God, they were evil works, and his brothers were righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you, even the world that pronounce that professes a worshiping of God. Because they're not saved. They're the wicked one. We know. There's no, no scripture. We know that we have passed from death into life because, he say if, he says, because we love the brethren. You want to be saved or not? You love the brethren? You are. You don't, you're not. Real simple, cut and dry. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. God says to hate your brother, you may as well kill him. Because he didn't say anything different about it. In fact, I learned from Colombo, TD detector. Now, three components make a crime. Means, opportunity, and motive. Once the detective has those three things solved, he presents the case to the district attorney for trial. Means, the ability to do it. Some crimes they can look at and see that it took a man to do the murder. Other cases have a feminine touch about them. This was a woman that did it. Opportunity, the time, or the place to do it. And motive, that person have a reason to commit the crime. Same thing here. Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And the only reason he hasn't killed his brother physically is because those three components weren't available. Some folks say, I can never kill anybody. Read Romans chapter three. Romans 3 says, you have murder in you. Given opportunity, you will murder. If not for salvation. Given opportunity, you will steal. If not for salvation. Given opportunity, you'll do anything that's possible to be done. But what constrains us? The seed in us. I said in the message, first message, that a sinner doesn't have to try to qualify to be a sinner. He has to go out and, and, and rob a bank today to keep his center status active. 
He's a sinner by virtue of the fact that his father's seed is in him. Adam's. And so he can't even help but he's going to act like his father Adam. It says about Adam, it says Adam began a son in his own image after his own likeness and his name was to be Cain. And they like their father. Except one heard the heavenly father, one obeyed the earthly father, one killed, and one brought God a sacrifice. That's the difference. Hope that explains the sin issue to you. Sin dwells in your, in your members. But he that has God's seed inside of them, they cannot sin because salvation is an issue of the soul, not the flesh. But even in the flesh, the good news is that Christ was crucified, it says, in the flesh. His flesh hung upon the cross. And those who believe in Christ and put themselves are baptized in Christ, you are, your flesh is also crucified with him. And therefore the sins of your flesh can't really affect you because it's already dead. It's just trying its best to stay alive. That's all it is. There's a scripture, I can't think of it, the illustration about defeating our enemy, Satan. Because we're death throws. He's a, an enemy already defeated. If it looks like he's still alive and making moves on you, he's actually still wiggling out of death. He's been destroyed. That's why it says resist him. And he'll flee from you. Now, if he sees no resistance, he has no reason to run. He's like, I, I, I can take this. But being already defeated, what he does not want is another defeat. So by resisting him, he just takes off the body. Okay, I, I got defeated already back in the garden. I'm, not, I'm about to stick around and have one of these human beings do it. God does it to me. He ain't running from you. Because he knows these are, these are creatures inferior to me, and I have no reason to run from them. And so when you resist him, it puts his face in the dirt. He's got to run. That's the promise God made. All right? So I'm saying that. Amen. Can we do a second offering? We're fair. Well, short today. I can't even meet our expenses today, so just do what you can, all right?